September 1st, 2009, Fester Blatter Dancing Pole, a commemoration ceremony for the 70th anniversary of Germany's attack on Poland. German Chancellor Angela Merkel. Sehr geehrter Herr Staatspräsident, Dear Mr. President, Herr Ministerpräsident, Prime Minister, liebe Kolleginnen und Kollegen, Exzellenzen, Exzellenzies, meine Damen und Herren, ladies and gentlemen. Heute, vor 70, 70 years ago today, begann mit dem deutschen Überfall auf Polen, with Germany's attack on Poland, began the most tragic chapter in the history of Europe. This war, instigated by Germany, brought immeasurable suffering on many peoples, years of disenfranchisement, humiliation, and destruction. I commemorate the many millions of people who lost their lives in battle and in resistance to Germany. I commemorate those 60 million who died in this war, instigated by Germany. They insult this nation over months and threaten to destroy her, to fight battles in Berlin, to chop Germany's armies, to move the frontier to the Oder or to the Elbe rivers, and so forth. And this nation, Germany, each month can only patiently watch these two, in particular the English and the French warmongers, who badly need this war and not peace. We need a long war, as Mr. Chamberlain has said, at least three years long, and for my peace proposal, I am verbally abused and personally insulted before the whole world. Mr. Chamberlain denies and categorically refuses to even discuss peace. I hear from London only one cry, that now this war must go forward, and that it must continue, even if it means that England thereby is destroyed. It is not, however, my intention to wage war, but to build a new socialist nation of the highest culture. And every year of this war robs me of that work. Hitler's war? What have the historians neglected to tell us? August. 22nd of August, 1939, the final days before the beginning of the Second World War have arrived. A few days of intensive negotiations between the European powers will decide whether the remaining stipulations of the Treaty of Versailles will remain in effect or be lifted and thereby decide whether there will be peace or war in Europe. six and a half years earlier. Thirtieth of January, 1933, the National Socialists celebrate their rise to power. Their victory was the result of the collapse of the Weimar Republic. No less than 20 social democratic, middle-class dominated cabinets with 12 different chancellors have failed. Millions of Germans live in hunger. Sebastian Hafner, an outspoken enemy of the Third Reich, describes the atmosphere during the takeover as follows. It was a very common and widely felt feeling of salvation and liberation from democracy. To begin to revive the decimated German economy, the National Socialists institute four-year plans in which the economic goals and required labor programs were defined. The man responsible for the creation and implementation of these plans was Hermann Goering. Of prime importance to the National Socialists was improving the health and well-being of the middle class through government contracts. An important office created to combat mass unemployment was the Reichsarbeitsdienst, in other words, the National Labor Service. This six-month-long work service unshackles the labor market, bringing qualified training to the youth, 
and creating work projects for the common good. In the agricultural sector alone, these measures and the hours of service which they made possible amounted to many hundreds of millions of workdays for Germans, whether through draining swamps, forestry, road building, or labor for the harvests, the achievements of the Reichsarbeitsdienst are undisputed. The social and economical boom could not be denied. The armaments industry in Germany did not play the major role in the recovery that many today would have us believe. The vast majority of German enterprises produced goods and services for the private sector and for domestic consumption. Hitler's initial foreign policy objectives are humble and reserved, and only upon his realization that the World War I victors are ignoring him with his conservative approach does he change his tactics. Hitler then begins to focus his attention upon the German state of Tsarland, which in the Treaty of Versailles had been transferred to France for a period of 15 years. Thereafter, the people of Tsarland were to be offered a referendum on whether to remain in France, become neutral, or to reunify with Germany again. The result of this referendum dashed the hopes of the French, when 90.8% of the people of Tsarland demanded a reunification with the German Reich. On March 1, 1935, the state of Tsarland is restored to German sovereignty. Hitler, having just won his first international political victory, gives the State of the Nation address to the Reichstag National Parliament where he ceremoniously buries any and all further German claims on the French-occupied Alsace-Lorraine region. His next concern is the demilitarized Rhineland. In 1921 and 23, France and Belgium had used Germany's demilitarization of the Rhineland to occupy the Ruhr Valley region with their own troops. In 1925, despite this insulting violation, the German Reich reaffirmed its commitment to the demilitarization of the western border region by signing the Pact of Locarno. For this gesture, Germany is rewarded with membership in the League of Nations. Simultaneously, France, Belgium and Germany make guarantees to each other to make no further territorial claims upon one another. Just ten years later, however, this treaty is violated. France signs a mutual assistance pact with the Soviet Union, which is clearly aimed at the German Reich. Not only did France flagrantly violate the Pact of Locarno, but thereby also nullified the German-Polish non-aggression pact. With that treaty, Hitler had created a secure eastern border with Poland, and thereby had circumvented France's policy of encirclement. Thus, France, with her new ally, the Soviet Union, successfully recreated this ring around Germany. After this treaty violation by France, Hitler no longer felt bound to the Pact of Locarno, and thus he ordered German troops into the previously undefended German territory of the Rhineland on March 7, 1936.
Hitler had already explained his intentions regarding the Rhineland to the leaders of his military and the Foreign Office, both of which advised him against this course of action, warning that Paris would likely react militarily, but Hitler, who anticipates a different reaction, is proven correct. Let's take a moment to go back to the years after World War I. In Versailles, both the victors and the losers agree, in this same treaty, to reduce their troops to an essential minimum level. The treaty demands, however, that Germany disarm first, and then the other nations are to follow. Germany fulfills its duty up until 1927, downsizing the Reichswehr, or National Defense Forces, to just 100,000 men in the army and 15,000 in the naval forces. The Air Force is eliminated entirely. Now it's the Allies' turn to keep their commitments and disarm, as stipulated in the Treaty of Versailles. In reality, however, France, England and the USA have no intention of disarming as agreed upon. Quite the opposite, in fact, as France, England and the USA maintain their extensive military forces, and France in particular, their land and air forces, while the USA and England retain all of their naval assets. Indeed, all three invest significantly in the modernization of their arsenals requests by Germany to at least be permitted to bring its existing defense forces into a viable state simply go ignored. When Hitler comes to power in 1933, France and its allies, not even including the Soviet Union, are already 12 times superior to the German Reich in terms of active army divisions. And when the number of equipped and ready army reserves are included in these calculations, the level of superiority amounts to a ratio of 97 to 1. In the following years, during the Geneva disarmament negotiations, Hitler proposes on six occasions to limit the quantity of certain weapons categories, such as bombers, artillery cannons, and other heavy weapons for all member states. When his proposals fail, he begins to rebuild the small Reichswehr into a strong and modern Wehrmacht, or combined armed forces. Hitler's next foreign policy objective is the reunification of Austria with the Reich. At this stage, such action would be considered unilateral annexation. It is essential, therefore, to revisit the historical relationships. Until the Prussian-Austrian War of 1866, Austria and Germany had been united through the Second Reich for nearly 1,000 years, and also later in the Bund, or German Confederation, after the defeat of 1918 and subsequent annulment of the Habsburg Empire, the victors decimated that empire, leaving just its German-speaking core, which was Austria. The first National Assembly of Vienna decided in favor of a reunification of Austria with neighboring Germany. Polls in some Austrian federal districts showed overwhelmingly support amongst the people for such a move. The right of self-determination, however, was apparently not extended to the vanquished of World War I. As such, the first attempt at reunification failed, only because the Allied victors themselves had refused to allow it. In 1933, a conservative dictatorship emerged in Austria, which removed both the right of citizens to vote and also denied reunification with the new Third Reich. The despotic Austrian Chancellor, Dr. Engelbert Dollfuss, prohibited both trade unions and political parties including the Social Democrats, National Socialists, as well as the Communists. During an attempted coup by the Austrian National Socialists in July of 1934, Dolphus was fatally shot. In March of 1938, his successor, Dr. Kurt Schuschnigg, attempted to circumvent the popular will for a reunification with the German Reich by way of a very peculiar type of referendum on extremely short notice. On March 9, 1938, he announces a nationwide referendum on the question of reunification with the Reich to be held on March 13, just four days later. During this referendum, there were to be no electoral registrars. Supervision of the election would be entirely in the hands of his own party. Citizens in the public service were ordered to only go to the referendum under direct supervision of their superiors. 
Furthermore, they were to openly show their completed referendum ballots to their respective superiors. People were only permitted to vote against reunification with the Reich. Those who wished to vote in favor of a reunification with Germany were to make their own ballots. Austria's Home Secretary, a National Socialist by the name of Dr. Seiss Inquart, on three occasions demanded that Chancellor Schuschnigg postpone his referendum and hold one later in a lawful constitutional manner. But his protests were in vain. Schuschnigg called that nonsense, and he categorically refused. Finally, Seiss Inquart contacted his German counterpart, Home Secretary Goering, who had spent part of his youth in Austria, who then, in turn, passed the ball to Hitler. Goering, having lived in Austria in his youth, and Hitler as well, being born in the Austrian town of Braunau, on the border with Germany, watched Schuschnigg's attempts at manipulation with disgust. All attempts to convince Schuschnigg to resign failed. It is only when Goering eventually threatened to send in German troops that Schuschnigg would suddenly resign. During the morning hours of the following day, German troops entered Austria, marching towards Salzburg, Lenz, and Innsbruck through flower-filled streets with National Socialist colors being openly displayed and were greeted with jubilation and tears of joy from the Austrian people. When Hitler arrived in Vienna the next day, the Austrians welcomed him triumphantly. The oldest branch of the German people shall from now on be the youngest bastion of the German nation and Reich. I shall, in this hour of the German people, declare my greatest success as a leader and the chancellor of the German nation and the Reich. In this moment of German history, I welcome the entrance of my homeland, Austria, into the German Reich. Almost simultaneously, Austrian troops entered Munich, Dresden, Stuttgart, and Berlin as a sign to the world of a peaceful and voluntary reunification, and not one of conquest. In the meantime, on March 13, Chancellor Seiss Inquart of Austria and Adolf Hitler signed a pact declaring their joint intention of reunification of Austria with the German Reich. Then, on April 10, 1939, a nationwide referendum is duly held and the approval of the Austrian people is confirmed with 99.73% of the Austrians voting in favor of the reunification with the German Reich. So much for the annexation of Austria. Deutschen Stammes waren wir immer, bis ein Hader uns zerriss. Dieses kleine Lied, es soll euch mahnen, soll euch sagen, was in Zukunft werden soll. Deutsche Ostmark, euer Kamerad, ihr solltet nie mehr euch entzwei. Blaue Donau, grüner Rhein. Ihr sollt stets Gefährten sein, blau die Treue, grün die Hoffnung, auf ein einig deutsches Land, blaue Donau, grüner Rhein, ihr sollt stets verbunden sein, ewig schließe sich das Band um das deutsche Vaterland. Let's go back to the years just after World War I. Czechoslovakia, an artificial construct of the Allies, emerges in 1919, comprising Czechia, Slovakia, and a small part of the Ukraine. These three territories had never before in history constituted a unified nation-state. Some 6.7 million Czechs, 3.1 million Germans, 2 million Slovaks, 700,000 Hungarians, and 460,000 Ukrainians are suddenly combined into a single multi-ethnic state in which the Czechs Czechs and the Slovaks dominate. The more than 3 million Germans, who live primarily in the regions bordering alongside Germany and Austria, call themselves the Sudeten Germans, a name derived from the Sudeten Mountains. Their demands for reunification with Austria are denied by the Allies. The basis of this new multi-ethnic country called Czechoslovakia was the Treaty of Versailles and the Treaty of Saint Germain, which clearly stated that the national minorities are to have 
internal autonomy. The terms of the treaties of Versailles and Saint Germain are accepted with friendly, cheerful, and smiling faces by the Czechs and Slovaks until they later joyfully and smilingly declare them null and void. As early as 1920, the new Czech constitution abolishes the right to self-determination for the minority Germans, Hungarians, and Poles. Consequently, the minorities become culturally and economically more and more oppressed. As of September 1937, the Sudeten Germans negotiations with the Czech government regarding autonomy had been in vain. To this point, reunification with Sudeten territories and the Reich had never been discussed, nor even proposed by Hitler. Beginning in May 1938, however, attacks by ethnic Czechs against the German minority increased dramatically, and consequently the Sudeten German representative publicly demands the reunification of the Sudetenland with the German Reich. The government in Prague, however, responds by declaring martial law over all of the 13 Sudeten provinces, thus prompting Hitler to demand the return of the Sudeten territories to the German Reich. In a hastily arranged conference in Munich on September on September 20th, the heads of state of England, France, Italy and Germany all agree to return the Sudeten territories, inhabited primarily by Germans, to the Reich. Thus, three million more Germans are again reunited with their home. The Memo Land, cut off by the World War I victors in 1919, and as a mandate of the League of Nations under French control, was annexed in violation of the League of Nations by Lithuania in 1920. After the Sudeten Germans' successful return to the Reich, the Germans in Memel regions also demanded their return to the Reich. The Lithuanian government, however, attempts to gain the support of England and France in its claim of jurisdiction over the Memel territories. However, both countries refuse to weigh in. As a result, the Lithuanian government agrees to a treaty with Germany for the return of Memel to the Reich on March 22, 1939. The Lithuanians then withdraw their administrators and troops. In return, Lithuania receives a free market zone in Memel and free right-of-way for a 99-year duration. The return of the small Memel territories was, however, by and large, inconsequential for the Reich. There were, however, some reverberations as Poland began to feel alienated. Warsaw feared a similar situation might arise in the free state of Danzig, situated in Poland, but technically under mandate of the League of Nations. The victorious allies had, however, from the start, granted Poland many additional rights over postal services, businesses, thoroughfares, transit fees, duties, and tariffs. And as such, Danzig was, for all intents and purposes, already under Polish control. Despite these extra concessions, which already exceeded the existing treaties, Poland remained unsatisfied. The Polish government 
publicly threatened several times to completely annex Danzig. Let's go back now to the years just after the World War. In spite of her territorial gains, Poland is still unsatisfied with the new order in Eastern Europe. The Polish delegation at Versailles, Roman Domowski, had even then proclaimed that these territories granted to this newly created nation of Poland were merely a down payment on a much greater Poland. Directly after the end of the First World War, Poland began to build up its military and even as late as 1938 had attacked the Soviet Union, which had been weakened by the revolution. They also attacked Lithuania, Germany and Czechoslovakia and even annexed some border regions of the neighboring states. For this reason, the border conflicts of the next 20 years were predestined. Until 1934, conflicts between Germany and Poland smoldered. In the previous year, just after Hitler had won the elections, the Polish head of state, Marshal Pilsudski, several times sought to enlist France for the purpose of effecting a bilateral attack against Germany. France, however, declined to participate, and so Poland eventually changed tactics. Finally then, in 1934, the Friendship Treaty was signed, introducing a period of closer diplomatic relations, but under the surface, disputes were still simmering. Nancy, in particular, situated on the Baltic coast next to East Prussia, had been completely cut off from the Reich and became the new focus of political attention. Of the 370,000 inhabitants of Danzig, 97% were Germans and just 3% other nationals, primarily Poles. Irrespective of this fact, Warsaw continued to try to wrest total control over the strategically important harbor city. The German demand for reunification of Danzig with the Reich constitutes just one of the three reasons that would lead to the coming war between Germany and Poland. In West Prussia, which was taken from the Reich and given to Poland with the Versailles Treaty, the situation was similar. Here, two-thirds of the populations professed loyalty to Germany. Due to the loss of West Prussia, East Prussia was now completely cut off from the German Reich. This untenable situation would, thus, constitute the second of the three reasons for the eventual outbreak of what would become World War II. All transport connections from the Reich to the now isolated East Prussia were under Polish control. The coal transports essential for East Prussia's supply of energy could only be affected via eight railroad routes, which were now fully under Polish control. Following the world economic crisis and the crash of the German currency, Germany could no longer pay the required transit fees in their full amount in Zlotys, that is the Polish currency. And thus, one by one, Poland began to close the railroad lines. The Poles felt justified, claiming that Germany was violating the rules set in the Treaty of Versailles by paying the required tariffs in Reichmarks instead of Zlotys. Germany, on the other hand, felt obligated and justified to avoid the economic economic strangulation of Eastern Prussia by all means. When the Polish government threatened to cut off all of the railroad lines in 1936, Germany developed the concept of an extraterritorial highway and railroad link through Polish-occupied West Prussia towards East Prussia and to thereby reunite Danzig with the German Reich. In order for such a plan to be implemented, negotiations begin between Berlin and Warsaw. The core of Germany's first proposal on October 20th 24, 1938, was an offer to accept Polish sovereignty over the former German territories of Upper Silesia, West Prussia, and Posen. Poland had tried several times previously and unsuccessfully to gain such concessions on territorial rights since 1920. In exchange for this, Germany expected extraterritorial transportation lines to East Prussia and reunification with Danzig. Of the more than 20 previous administrations of the former Weimar Republic, not a a single one had granted such far-reaching concessions to the Poles.
Hitler was the first. The negotiations continued on until the end of January 1939, but in spite of Poland's publicly stated intentions of working out a mutually satisfactory solution, these never came to fruition. During further discussions in January, Hitler expands his proposals with the following compromise. Danzig would return to the German community socially, but would remain economically under Poland. Because Danzig's League of Nations mandate is not Polish, this proposal is a genuine compromise. In February and March 1939, even as Germany is still looking for a peaceful settlement, Poland is already thinking seriously about war. In February, the Polish General Staff develops guidelines for military operations against Germany. On March 4, 1939, the so-called Main Staff begins planning for Operation West, a full month before Hitler orders the leadership of the Wehrmacht to commence work on Fall Weiss' plan for an attack against Poland. At this point, the World War I allies have already placed their bets on the outcome of this game. As early as March 1939, London and Paris guaranteed their support to Warsaw in the event that the Danzig and Corridor questions would develop into a military confrontation. When the former Reich Chancellor Heinrich Brüning, living in exile in London at the time, proposes a compromise to the English Foreign Office aiming to avoid a military showdown, he is gruffly brushed off by Churchill, who makes it unequivocally clear to Brüning where Great Britain's interests lie. Winston Churchill states, what we want is for the German economy to be completely smashed. The ranks begin to close with the French ambassador in Berlin, André Francois Ponce, stating, You have to live with the Germans, but it would be way better if one could just drive them out of Europe, like the Arabs were once chased out of Spain. On May 15, French Chief of Staff General Gamelin assured the Polish Minister of War, General Kaspritsky, that in case of war, the French army would indeed attack with all its might the western border of Germany, and together with Poland, they would put Germany in a vice. That promise served to reinforce Poland's anti-German stance. Warsaw was encouraged by this promise, and from then on became increasingly undiplomatic in its tone towards Berlin. While the British, the French, and the Poles commenced to shore each other up for an impending war against Germany, Hitler continues to pursue a negotiated settlement of the problems with Poland. On April 28, in a memorandum to the Polish administration, and in a speech to the Reichstag, the German parliament, Hitler yet again acknowledges Poland's claim on West Prussia and its need to access to the Baltic Sea. Furthermore, he offered additional treaties between the two nations. No threats towards Poland are made, and not a single word about war is uttered. Had the Poles accepted this offer, and in a counter move granted the extraterritorial highways and the reunification of Danzig, World War II would have been avoided. Bolstered by English and French guarantees of war support, Poland has no further incentive to negotiate in good faith with Germany, and in the meantime, in Warsaw, maps are suddenly starting to circulate, which contain a new western Polish border extending to just west of Berlin. All across Poland, the so-called pogroms against the minorities begin. In Galicia, Ukrainians are detained, while Germans are forcibly deported to the Polish interior by the thousands. German stores are boycotted. Their farms torched and ethnic Germans are physically assaulted, and on three separate occasions, Polish air defenses open fire upon German Lufthansa civilian airline transport planes en route to Königsberg. In July and August of 1939, facing increasingly violent attacks, ethnic Germans now become a wave of refugees. Night after night, Polish border officials shot at the fleeing Germans. Nonetheless, many would try to make their way to safety and freedom. 
Shortly before the official outbreak of war, there were already 80,000 ethnic Germans in refugee camps in both Danzig and the German Reich. Hitler, on numerous occasions, advised the English and the French administration that, with regard to this drama, a solution to the German-Polish question cannot be delayed anymore. The misery of the minority Germans in Poland was now far overshadowing the still open questions concerning Danzig. The misery of 1939 had now developed to the third and most pressing reason that would lead to the outbreak of war. Hitler concludes that these problems might, in the worst case scenario, only be resolved by means of warfare. In the summer of the year 1939, Hitler gives the order for 52 army divisions to be deployed. One aspect we have not paid any attention to so far is the role of the Soviet Union. Soviet politics up to this point had primarily been isolationist, but the Soviet leadership still dreamed of a worldwide Bolshevik revolution. The unscrupulous tactician Joseph Stalin is still very much committed to Lenin's doctrine and is awaiting the outbreak of a communist revolution in Europe. Stalin, however, has no faith in the established communist parties of Western Europe and would prefer an externally forced revolution. For this purpose, he orders that the Red Army be transformed into a modern offensive army that can, in the right moment, bring the fire of revolution into the heart of Europe. To finance this, he savagely plundered his own people, costing many millions of lives. His aim was to squeeze as much out of the farmers as possible in order to sell it abroad. The profits would be used to pay for the Western technologies he required for the upgrade of his army. While the exact cost in terms of human lives in this tragedy remains unclear to this day, it is certain that, in the Ukraine alone, the breadbasket of Russia, at least five million people perished from starvation, and of these, the elderly and children accounted for the majority of the victims, while Stalin's minions confiscated their seeds in order to finance his ambitious plan for the modernization of his armed forces. By 1934, the Soviet Union already possessed more tanks than all of the other European powers combined. And in 1941, immediately prior to Germany's Eastern Campaign, Soviet combat tanks already numbered approximately 24,000. Stalin's strategy was based largely upon a plan created by Mikhail Tukhachevsky, head of the Revolutionary War Committee, who as early as the beginning of the 1930s had developed a concept of exporting revolution. In Tukhachevsky's model, the Red Army's role was that of fighting and winning wars through highly destructive deep penetration into enemy territory through superior tank and air forces, and if necessary, even the use of chemical warfare. Stalin's commitment to this concept explains the volume of a mass-produced tank type called Clement Voroshilov, or KV, which was especially designed for Western Europe's well-developed network of roads. After the English and Soviet negotiators establish a possible framework for an alliance against Germany in April and June of 1939, a French and English delegation traveled to Moscow in August to begin to lay the groundwork for a war against Germany. Stalin, however, delays the representatives of the Western powers, stalling for time as he gets his own separate plans in order. Stalin is not interested in peace, he wants war in Europe and nothing else, and only under his own terms does he choose his allies. 
auch Deutschland bemüht. Germany, however, also seeks to cut a deal with the Soviet Union. Hitler seeks an alliance with Stalin before striking Poland. He erroneously assumes that a pact with Russia might prevent England and France from acting militarily against Germany. Stalin, on the other hand, is convinced that a German strike against Poland would result in a French and English declaration of war against Germany. This would create exactly the perfect storm which Lenin had prescribed in his Doctrine of 1920, for a military showdown between the rival communist and capitalist blocs of Europe. On August 15, 1939, as Germany offers Stalin a mutual non-aggression pact and a fair distribution of the respective spheres of mutual interest in Eastern Europe, Stalin achieves his goal. He is confident now that the situation has reached a critical mass, and therefore he calls for a secret meeting of the Politburo on August 19, 1939. Only within the realm of his most trusted inner circle does Stalin finally let the cat out of the bag. Stalin stated, The question of peace or war has reached a critical phase. The solution hangs entirely upon the position that the Soviet Union shall take. We are absolutely convinced that, if we sign a treaty of allegiance with France and England, Germany will be forced to shy away from Poland and to seek a temporary resolution with the Western powers. This way, a war could be avoided. On the other hand, however, if we accept Germany's proposals for a non-aggression treaty, then Germany will most certainly attack Poland, and the intervention of England and France will become unavoidable. Under these circumstances, we have a great opportunity to stay out of the conflict and patiently bide our time. It is imperative for us that this war last as long as possible until both sides are exhausted. That's exactly what's in our interest. Promptly, the Soviets turn away from England and France in the direction of Germany. On August 23rd, a German-Soviet non-aggression treaty is signed. Hitler's bag is now cleared for an attack on Poland. But just then something happens that should not escape our attention. Hitler delays the previously established date of August 26 for an attack by the Wehrmacht on Poland and tries one more time to negotiate with Warsaw in attempting to reach a successful outcome to this initiative. Hitler begs the English government for assistance in the talks with the Poles and offers London, Germany's assistance, and a friendship pact. The aim, besides a peaceful resolution of the Polish-German conflicts, would be a final settlement of all British-German differences. Hitler offers a guarantee for Poland's borders, as well as his future support for the British Empire should it ever need military support. England, however, evades this offer and plays for time, delaying Hitler by hinting at Poland's possible readiness to negotiate, while at the same time telling Warsaw to maintain its hard and bitter stance towards Germany. London is now going to play a game of cat and mouse with Berlin for several days. For the sake of appearances on the international stage and to temporarily pacify Germany, London finally urges Poland to negotiate with Germany. But the English foreign minister sends Warsaw a mixed message. Indeed, the Polish government needs to negotiate, but nobody in London will misinterpret the Poles' readiness to negotiate any concessions with regard to this issue. In plain text, the message to Poland was as follows. Negotiations, yes, but the concessions toward Germany are not expected. Also of historical importance in this context is the role of the American President, Roosevelt. Despite already knowing for seven days that Hitler has agreed to the Soviet Union's demand for East Poland becoming a sphere of Soviet influence, Roosevelt fails to pass on this information to the Polish government. 
It doesn't require much imagination to realize that the Polish government, had it known of this arrangement, would have preferred the reunion of Danzig with the German Reich over the loss of Eastern Poland. On August 30th, Hitler makes his final offer to Poland. He demands the reunification of Danzig to the German Reich as compensation for Germany's approval on Poland's acquisition of formerly German territories after World War I. Furthermore, he demands a referendum of the inhabitants in the so-called corridor, the former land bridge between Pomerania and East Prussia the inhabitants of that area, for which Hitler formerly had only demanded extraterritorial transit ways, now shall decide themselves whether they are Polish or German. The nation that would win this referendum would be obliged to grant to the other nation extraterritorial transit ways. This means either a German transit way from Pomerania to West Prussia, or a Polish transit way from within Poland to the Polish Baltic harbor Gdynia. No matter the outcome of this proposed referendum, Gdynia should remain with Poland. The Polish government reacts, however, as if it had been advised by the British in advance, and Poland does not accept any compromise. Finally, in the afternoon of August 31st, 1939, a 10-day-long negotiation marathon concludes with yet another Polish refusal. The contents of the notes, telephone calls, and personal talks during these negotiations, which took place between London, Warsaw, and Berlin, were placed in the files of all of the respective diplomats and administrations, and in such an efficient manner that there can be no doubt about the correctness of the description of Hitler's final peace initiative. Hitler is often quoted as having said, shortly before the outbreak of the war, I am just afraid that in the last moment some dirty dog may come along with an intermediate proposal. This suggests that the German side, and especially Hitler himself, didn't want to negotiate. It is merely a fabrication from the Nuremberg trials. When the Polish government on August 31, 1939, refuses again to get into direct negotiations with Germany, Hitler finally gives the order for the Wehrmacht to attack Poland on the next morning. On September 1st, 1939, the German Wehrmacht lines up for the battle against Poland. In his address broadcast to the German people, Hitler states, I have come to the decision to talk to the Poles in the same way that they have spoken to us for months. As of 5.45 hours today, we are firing back. From now on, every bomb will be repaid with a bomb. On September 3rd, England and France, in keeping with their pact with the Poles, declare war upon Germany. Almost the entire Commonwealth and some French colonies follow suit. The dispute over Danzig, the corridor, and the human rights of the German minority in Poland has, in a two-day time period, developed into World War II. Right from the beginning, the civilian populations are impacted as well. On the one hand, German troops cannot always avoid that civilians will be affected, but on the other hand, the Polish population, with the full support of the military from the beginning, starts to hunt German civilians who still live in Poland. A wave of house searches is followed by depredation, displacement, abuses, robberies, rapes, and murders of more than 5,000 citizens within Poland. 
mother tongue is German, and they lose their lives in disgusting fashion. The greatest bloodbath takes place during day three of the war in the city of Bromberg, where approximately 1,000 are murdered. The conflict escalates when Polish snipers, after the withdrawal of the regular Polish troops, initiate partisan warfare against Germans. On September the 4th, war also begins in the west. England's air force, with 16 bombers, attack German ships that lay in the harbors at Kutzhofen, Wilhelmshaven, and Brunsbüttel. One day later, the German U-boats in the Royal Navy begin their war in the Atlantic, and on the same day, both sides sink their first enemy trade ships. On September the 6th, a German directive comes into effect ordering German forces to neither shoot at nor to inspect French fighting ships, as the government of the Third Reich makes further attempts to keep France out of the war. On September 10th, England violates the neutrality of the small country of Belgium as her bombers fly through her airspace, possibly in an attempt to drag Belgium into the war. From September 12th onwards, British troops begin to land on the continent to bolster the French forces. In taking this step, England has already fulfilled its treaty obligations towards the Poles, yet without really helping them in the least. France finally also lives up to her alliance responsibilities by adding further 80 divisions in the west, between the North Sea and Switzerland, creating a daunting strike force which, in the beginning, is opposed by only 11 German divisions. A full scale attack by the French against the Germans in any manner that would have provided some relief to the Poles never takes place. Meanwhile, the attack by Hitler's Wehrmacht progresses rapidly through Poland. On September 5, 1939, the Polish High Command had given orders to the army under Rudnitsky, which is deployed in the northwest of Poland, to try to avoid conflict with the German troops, to destroy any potential food, etc. in that zone, and to leave only desolate and destroyed countryside for the advancing Germans. For the first time in World War II, the principle of scorched earth is now being used. While the German Wehrmacht overruns Poland, the inner circle of the Bolshevik leadership assembles in Moscow on September 7, 1939. In a short address, Stalin again discloses his strategy. The war is being fought by two kinds of capitalistic states. We have nothing against them beating each other up and weakening themselves. Hitler himself is unwittingly shattering the capitalistic system. We have room to maneuver and can bring up one side against the other to engage them with each other even more. But Stalin's plan is not successful in every respect. Convinced that the Polish army could hold off the Wehrmacht for a certain amount of time, the Red Army is entirely surprised by the speed of the Germans' advance. As a lightning-quick German victory is manifesting, Stalin orders the invasion of East Poland to secure his half of the Union. Only one day later, on September 18th, the German Wehrmacht succeeds in capturing all regions of Poland west of the Kukan Line, except for the capital of Warsaw itself. On September 19th, the French and English react to the Soviets' involvement in the war and demand that Moscow withdraw her troops from Poland. If this should not happen, the threat from Paris and London is that a declaration of war would automatically follow. It remains, however, only a threat. Four weeks later, the British and the French initiate secret negotiations with the Russians in order to eventually drag them into a common war against Germany. In the early morning hours of September 16, a German peace envoy transmits an ultimatum to the Polish lines in Warsaw, demanding that the Polish commander unconditionally surrender the city. 
Andernfalls and if not, but the city will be treated as a fortress. The Polish commander, who during the past days equipped the city with anti-tank walls, barricades, and installations for defense, refuses to accept this ultimatum. Then, shortly before midnight, a second ultimatum is broadcast by radio, urging the persons in charge to send negotiators to the German lines at 10 p.m. The Polish negotiators never came. Leaflets are dropped from airplanes, but also to no avail. On September 26, after several rounds of fire from German artillery, the full assault on the city commences. Twenty-four hours later, Warsaw capitulates. The number of deaths and injured, including many civilians, is estimated at 40,000. The German-Polish-Soviet War ends with the defeat of Poland after only 29 days. One week later, having achieved his objectives, Hitler proposes a peace deal with England and France. In his secret address, he offers to clear his occupied part of Poland, except for the corridor territories. Paris and London, however, refuse the offer. Their goal, evidently, is not at all to rescue Poland, but rather the complete destruction of Germany. In spite of the fact that France had declared war on Germany, the gun still remained silent on the western border, while on the German-English front, in the Atlantic, and on the North Sea, the battle rages on. To improve her initial position, the Soviet Union, without a declaration of war, attacks Finland on November the 30th, 1939. Only 160,000 Finnish troops battled the Red Army aggressively, causing her significant losses in only a few months in a bitter winter battle. Almost 130,000 Soviet soldiers would die, and not until March 1940 did Finland finally surrender to Russia's superior military might. For the German manufacturers and armaments industry, the replenishment of Swedish ore from the Norwegian harbor of Narvik is vital, and both London and Paris know this as well. On March 2nd, and again on April 6th, the German government of the Reich offers peace to France and England, and the withdrawal of her troops from Poland. The English reply with the deployment of sea mines in Norwegian territorial waters. Only three days after the latest German peace offer, the Germans, the British, and the French all converge on Narvik and engage in battle.
After weeks of intense fighting, the German Wehrmacht occupies all of Norway and Denmark. The supply of ore is secured, but the German front lines are now being overstretched. The guns still remain silent on the western of French-German front line. But Berlin has not failed to notice that London is now deploying more and more troops to northern France. On the 10th of May 1940, England occupies neutral Iceland and approves her base of operations for the war in the northern Atlantic. The same day, the German Wehrmacht attacks France. Continuing to wait at this point would only benefit the Allies in their deployment of ground troops in Europe. As in World War I, neutral Belgium is occupied to strike at France by means of an encirclement from the north. The Wehrmacht again also marches into Belgium, as well as into the Netherlands and Luxembourg. France is ultimately defeated within six weeks, and the expression Blitzkrieg becomes infamous. Hitler still hopes for a peaceful resolution with London, and in a spectacular gesture, he chooses not to annihilate the British Expeditionary Corps, letting them escape by way of Dunkirk to England. On the 20th of June, Italy declares war on the already defeated France. The German side reacts with reservation to this move. Harvest helpers is the sneering expression that the German troops give the uninvited guests who have arrived to secure a share in the spoils and the glory, after the hard fighting was already completed.
While the world is focused on the Western theater of war, the Red Army occupies the Baltic states and parts of Romania, including the heavily ethnic German-populated Bokrovina. Between September 1939 and summer of 1940, Stalin breaks the existing non-aggression treaties with all of his six neighboring states. Yet the Western powers remain silent. In the occupied territories, Stalin's secret police establish a reign of terror and kill tens of thousands of innocent civilians. Not a word of criticism from London or Paris, who reserve judgment in the hopes that Stalin will yet become an ally against Germany. On 19th of July 1940, after the defeat of France, Hitler offers yet a third peace treaty to England. But once again, his efforts and hopes are in vain, and the war rages on. From the 7th of July onwards, Germany endeavors to defeat England by means of an air war, but this effort would also fail. On August 5th, Italy attacks British Somalia, and on the 13th, Britain occupies Egypt. In December, the formerly neutral USA delivers 50 cruisers to the British for their sea war against Germany. On September 1st, the Soviet Union introduces compulsory military service. Millions of young men head to the barracks. Shortly after, the German Secret Service informs Hitler about the content of a secret meeting of the highest Soviet from August 2nd, where it was openly stated that it would be necessary to postpone an attack of the Western neighbor. Not only is Hitler concerned on learning this, but the Romanian head of state, General Ion Atanescu, pleads with the leadership of the German Reich for military support against a possible Soviet attack. Hitler promises aid and sends troops to secure the Romanian oil fields of Ploiesti. In spite of England's desperate military situation, the British were surprised by the more than two dozen German offers of peace that reached the British Isles via secret diplomatic channels. From 18 pages and up to 12 separate copies of a limited memorandum, we see here copy number 8. The Foreign Ministry had compiled various neutral party and German peace initiatives. This memorandum was for the eyes of the most inner deciding circles only. Aided by this memorandum, a closer decision, it was hoped, would be made on whether and how to react to the German peace offers. Other such peace plans had been initiated, for example, by the Swedish industrialist Dollarus, by the former Chancellor of the Reich, Franz von Papen, the Vatican, the King of Sweden, the Finnish Prime Minister, the King of Spain, Dr. Ludwig Weishauer, and also Dr. Joseph Goebbels. But the new English Prime Minister, Winston Churchill, would have none of it. Although he is aware that England on her own cannot possibly defeat Germany, he does everything in his power to buy time and to drag Russia and the United States into the war. 
Churchill's policy of war escalation with millions of victims was in accordance with the British war doctrine established by chief ideologist and permanent undersecretary of the British Foreign Office, Sir Robert Vansittart, who personally established all guidelines for British diplomats in September 1940. Vanzetart stated, the enemy is the German Reich, not merely Nazism, and those who have not yet learned this lesson have learned nothing whatsoever. All possibility of compromise has now gone by, and it has got to be a fight to the finish, and a real finish. We have had more than enough of Mr. Dolores, Mr. Gerdler, Weisauer and company. Hence, the British foreign policy, in her absolute desire for war, made no distinction between Karl Gerdler, one of the leading heads of the German resistance, and the members of the National Socialist leadership, such as Joseph Goebbels. On the 12th of November 1940, the Soviet Foreign Minister Vyacheslav Molotov travels to Vienna to negotiate over more territorial demands of the Soviet Union. During this visit, Molotov informs Hitler on the Soviet demand for a Western security zone. Parts of this zone would include Finland, Bulgaria, Romania, Yugoslavia, the strategically important Straits of the Dardanelles, and the Danish Baltic seaport. Further expansions of his country in the direction of the Bulgarian Ocean and the Persian Gulf are not explicitly excluded by Molotov and remain as future options. Forderungen, die einer Einkreisung des Deutschen Reiches gleichkommen und von Hitler als unannehmbar zurückgewiesen werden. Angesichts dieser Entwicklung trifft Hitler die Entscheidung, die Sowjetunion anzugreifen, um einem drohenden Überfall Stalins zuvorzukommen. Dass er diesen Feldzug als notwendigen Präventivschlag ansieht, belegt eine Tagebucheintragung des deutschen Propagandaministers Dr. Goebbels über eine Besprechung mit Hitler. Goebbels zitiert Hitler darin mit folgenden Worten. Hitler responds, we have to act now. Moscow will stay out of the war until Europe is exhausted and bled to death. Then Stalin will Bolshevize Europe and take over full control of Europe. We shall put a spoke in his wheel. Russia would prefer to attack us when we become weak, and then we will have the two-front war, which I hope we can avoid through this preemptive action. One could not have assessed Stalin's true plans more precisely. Hitler's interpretation of Stalin's strategy is substantiated in the fact that Upon the return of his foreign minister Molotov, Stalin does not place the Red Army into a defensive posture, but rather one most suited for attack and territorial expansion. On October 28, 1940, in overstating her own might, fascist Italy attacks Greece and Yugoslavia. The ill-advised campaign stalls just as Mussolini's efforts in North Africa had and rapidly spirals downward into complete disaster. Between October 1940 and January 1941, the English engaged the Italians in the Balkans and in Africa, defeating them in both theaters. The Italian leader, Benito Mussolini, then asks Hitler for German military support, as Italy will be forced to drop out of the war if defeated. Hitler is thus forced to send German troops to Africa and the Balkans. Beating Yugoslavia in 11 days and Greece within three weeks. The German forces in North Africa, commanded by Erwin Rommel, successfully pushed the British troops back to the Libyan Egyptian border. Italy 
Italy, as an ally, is saved for the time being, but the price is high. The German front lines are stretched further day by day as the supply lines become even longer. Meanwhile, the Soviet threat continues to grow as the Red Army transforms itself into yet another enemy of the Reich. Finally, on May 5, 1941, Stalin shows his true intentions. In a speech to the graduates of the M.P. Frunze Military Academy in Moscow, he declares, now that we have invested sufficiently in our army and outfitted her with modern technology for battle, we must now switch from defense to offense. The wars with Poland and Finland were not defensive wars. We have already set ourselves upon the offensive in terms of politics. The Red Army is now a modern army, and a modern army is an army built for attack. Stalin's comments are not just empty threats. Indeed, the military budget of the Soviet Union already amounts to 43% of the gross national product. Just a day earlier, the Politburo ordered the construction of 20 new airplane runways and the further expansion of some 231 already existing runways, many of which were situated no more than 100 kilometers away from Germany's eastern frontier. On May 15th, Georgi Shukov, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff of the Red Army, updates Stalin on the latest developments along the German-Russian border and says, There is the possibility that Germany might attempt to thwart our offensive preparations with a surprise attack. Though the Soviet intentions are now rather transparent, through both their actions and their words, the Chief of Staff would later state that the Red Army never had any intention of expanding westward. Hitler, in spite of reports to the contrary, is well informed at this stage regarding Soviet troop deployments. Indeed, just one day before the meeting between Shukov and Stalin, Hitler met with the German Chiefs of Staff, bringing them up to speed in every detail regarding the Soviet plans and deployments of their offensive posture as well as the state of Soviet preparedness. Hitler uses this opportunity to inform them of the numerous Soviet airfields close to the eastern border and how he regards these as a clear threat of imminent invasion. He therefore orders a preemptive attack in order to prevent the Soviets from rolling across Europe. Although Hitler's army has been depleted by the previous campaigns and is still battling the British on numerous fronts, when they cross the Russian border on June 22, 1941, they encounter the largest ever invasion force ever assembled in the history of mankind. Close to 6 million soldiers, more than 25,000 tanks, and about 19,000 planes have been assembled in order to sweep across Western Europe. The Red Army, still in a state of preparation for an offensive against Germany, is now paralyzed. Trapped within their own minefields and barriers, the enemy is divided, and these divisions, which are now in an offensive posture, very close to the German border, find themselves corralled and virtually defenseless. Within a few short months, two million Red Army troops are captured and taken as prisoners of war by the Germans. While many German military experts are expecting a rapid collapse of the Soviet Union, Hitler is not as confident. In contrast to most members of the general staff, one of the few who privately expressed some concern regarding the Eastern Campaign is the designer of the German Panzer III tank, Heinz Guderian. On the outside, to his men, Hitler is brimming with confidence, but within his inner circle, he is skeptical about the prospects of victory over Stalin. Guderian stated, the Soviet Union is as much a frightening specter to Hitler as the ghost ship in the movie The Flying Dutchman.
In late summer 1941, the new Russian tank T-34 appears. It is superior in terms of its robustness and weaponry to any German model and becomes a source of concern for the German front lines. Its armor, of up to 7 centimeters or nearly 3 inches, made it virtually invincible. The consequences were rapidly felt, as within only a short time, the German tank divisions reported losses of 20% of their assets. Daily scenes such as these would become routine. German casualties soared with up to 86,000 dead, 295,000 wounded, and a further 20,000 missing in action. Ein nicht unbeträchtlicher Teil davon ging auf das Konto der russischen Partisanen, die mit äußerster Grausamkeit gegen die Lanzer vorgingen. They were not bound by any rules and made no distinction between doctors, medics, soldiers and wounded. In all areas of the Eastern Front, captured German troops were discovered to have been murdered with their arms tied behind their backs. The Wehrmacht War Crimes Bureau documented all such cases of partisan crimes and cruelty in the same accurate manner which it had also recorded German war crimes, and thus speaks volumes of their level of accuracy. To this day, however, not a single recorded case has been found showing that German soldiers systematically brutalized or maimed the prisoners of war in their custody. The execution of Soviet partisans remains a controversial issue. Partisans, regardless of their country of origin, violate Article 1 of the Hague Land Warfare Convention, which clearly defines four criteria regarding those who are legally competent to engage in legitimate warfare. Executions of any illegitimate partisans found to be illegally engaging the legitimate combatants was never in violation of the international law. Later on, German civilian partisans were also summarily executed by the Allies. It is interesting interesting historically that Vladimir Lenin withdrew his signature from the 1907 Convention for Land Warfare at The Hague, which established the military rules of conduct for future wars. The USSR also never signed on to the Geneva Convention of 1929, in which the treatment of prisoners also became subject to international law. As a result, the guidelines or protocols of the Geneva Convention were absent from the training manuals of the Soviet Red Army. Thus, according to international law, the Soviet Union was acting outside of the rules and norms established by the international community. In the far north, the progress of the German and Finnish troops came to a virtual standstill in mid-September. Again and again, Lieutenant Colonel Edward Beadle, who led the operations of the so-called Lapland Army, tried in vain to conquer the railroad from Murmansk to Leningrad, and whose mission was to halt the transportation of American arms shipments to the Soviet Union. Murmansk was the only seaport in the Soviet Arctic Circle that was ice-free all year round, as the Gulf Stream currents prevented the surface from freezing over, even at air temperatures of minus 50 degrees Celsius. The war in the Nordic forests caused the greatest difficulty for the Germans. As heavy equipment was hardly usable in the frigid climate, the burden of the battles was literally borne upon the shoulders of the German infantry. Considering the rough terrain and the inherent supply problems, there were never more than two German divisions operating at the front of Lapland. For this reason, large military advances were impossible, and progress on the field was determined by small raiding groups on small missions fighting a relatively silent and invisible war. As the German offensive against Murmansk was halted on the 14th of October, their casualties amounted to over 2,600 dead and missing, as well as 8,000 wounded. The seaports and railroads remained in Stalin's hands throughout the entire war. In 1941 alone, via Murmansk, the allegedly neutral Americans supplied the Red Army with more than 3,000 aircraft, 4,000 tanks, hundreds of thousands of vehicles, and vast stocks of munitions, equipment, and food. In mid-September, the rainy season had already set in.
midsection of the Eastern Front, on the 19th of September, the 6th Army conquered Kiev, the capital of the Ukraine Soviet Republic. The battle in the area of Kiev was a fiasco for the Soviet side, with more than 660,000 Red Army soldiers taken prisoner. The 2nd of October, 1941, at 0530 hours, marked the beginning of Operation Typhoon. Northeast of Smolensk, with 2,000 tanks, Army Group Center, under the command of Field Marshal Fedor von Bock, launched an offensive against Moscow. The first reports indicated a great success. Meanwhile, Guderian's armed corps reached Orel, conquering the city before turning north. Units of the 2nd Army progressed northeastward, past Bryansk, before turning south and merging with the armed units of the 3rd and 4th Army, then rounding Vyazma and sneaking up on the rear of Soviet defense forces. Fifty-five divisions of the Red Army were sitting ducks with no hope of escape. With yet another mass of Soviet troops defeated, the German 4th and 9th Army pushed further in the direction of Moscow. The German offensive had devastated the Red Army. By mid-October, approximately 670,000 more Soviet troops were taken prisoner. At the same time, the German Army Group South, led by von Rundstedt, defeated the 18th Soviet Army on the Azov Sea and captured another 100,000 men. These growing numbers of prisoners began to pose major problems for German forces. During the winter of 1941-42, to 42, hundreds of thousands of prisoners starved to death. The reason for this was the total collapse of the German logistical support, creating catastrophic resupply problems. Equally responsible for this tragedy, however, was Stalin's scorched earth policy. On his orders, beginning on the 17th of November, all settlements along the access roads to a depth of 40 to 60 centimeters deep and to a width of 20 to 30 kilometers wide are to be destroyed. Thus, the infrastructure was completely annihilated and both friend and foe were doomed. The destruction was carried out on the explicit orders of Stalin by Soviet commandos wearing German uniforms stolen from the dead, and these commandos would also leave some survivors as potential witnesses to a systematic extermination campaign, and might later testify of German atrocities. In this cold and calculated manner, Stalin fomented deep hatred against the German occupation forces. On the 9th of October, Joseph Goebbels, in conversation with the Chief of Army Staff, General Alfred Yodel, proposed a domestic campaign for the collection of wool to help the frontline troops to stay warm, as winter was now rapidly approaching. General Yodel retorted, Winter? By that time, they will be sitting in warm quarters in Leningrad and Moscow. Let that be our only concern. We have finally, without exaggeration, won this war. A few days later, the first snowflakes fell on the Eastern Front, spelling the beginning of the end, with snowstorms, nightly frost, and morning thaws, which by day turned the streets into a bottomless morass of mud. Within a few weeks, the German Eastern Army lost about one-third of its 500,000 vehicles. On the 16th of October, temperatures dropped to minus 8 Celsius. The winter of all winters had taken a firm grip over Russia. Long-range movements were now out of the question. Most of the troops were without winter clothing. On some fronts, more soldiers fell from frostbite than from war-related injuries. The supply of essential goods collapsed. Railroad trains could not run with their boilers damaged as a result of inadequate frost protection. Eventually, German aircraft also succumbed to the icy temperatures. The pilots, who during some 180,000 missions had destroyed over 15,000 aircraft, 3,200 tanks, 2,400 guns, and 58,000 enemy vehicles in the past six months, could no longer start the machines as the oil in the motors froze. On the 23rd of October, the Wehrmacht report announced 
Despite difficult weather conditions, the outer defensive position of the Soviet capital was breached across a broad front in recent days. In some places, our spearheads have attacked up to 60 kilometers into Moscow. In spite of all the hardships, the German units continued to fight, conquering Kharkov and thereby forcing access to the Crimea. In early November, Kursk and Feodosia on the Black Sea coast also fell into German hands. The number of fallen Germans had by now increased to 150,000 men. The capture of Rostov on Dion by army groups south on the 21st of November was described in the Wehrmacht report as being important for the continuation of the war. There was no more talk, however, regarding a fast Blitzkrieg victory. On November 29, 1941, German Minister of War Munitions, Fritz Todt, in a confidential conversation with Hitler stated that, in light of the superior levels of Allied arms and munitions, a military victory was no longer possible. Hitler replied, how am I supposed to end this war? I really don't see any way to end it through political means. At this moment, Hitler realizes, however, that he is trapped and there's no possibility of escape. Sometime later, Stalin strikes back. Against this huge war machine, which produces hundreds of tanks and aircraft every day, and is supported by the Western industrial nations, especially by America and Great Britain, with all kinds of war materials, the German Wehrmacht, in the long run, has no chance. From this point forward, the Allied powers will determine the pace of events. America now begins to enter the international political stage more openly. In spite of her official neutrality, the USA has already been supporting England logistically since 1940. In July 1941, American ships begin naval reconnaissance in the Atlantic Ocean, transmitting intelligence reports concerning areas of German submarine operations to the British. In July of 1941, the U.S. Navy begins providing escorts for British convoys. While the USA is still officially neutral, Hitler still forbids the German Navy to attack American warships at this stage. It is only when Japan attacks America and as an ally of the Reich appears to be in open military conflict that Hitler would follow suit and he then declares war against the USA. Just as in World War I, the same four largest opponents in that war now stand against Germany. And once again, it is the USA that will be the deciding factor with their financial power, technology, arms industry and troops. The surrender of the German 6th Army in Stalingrad and the German Africa Corps in Tunisia, the landing of the Allied troops in Sicily, the invasion of Normandy, the aerial bombing of German cities, and the collapse of the army groups of the Eastern Front, spell the end in a long line of defeats. Finally, on May 8, 1945, the soldiers of the German Wehrmacht lay down their arms.
Again, these same allied victors avail themselves of the booty without restraint. In some entire cities, the green light is given for looting. Hundreds of thousands of German patents are expropriated, advanced machinery, weapons, and technical equipment are carefully packed into boxes and shipped to the USA and the Soviet Union, along with captured German scientists. Millions of German prisoners of war are then conscripted into forced labor for many years. In the East, the victors expel millions of ethnic Germans from their ancestral homes, while the foreign military leaders confiscate houses for use as their own private quarters. The German Reich, or better said, that which remains, is divided into four colonies. The victors call them occupation zones. The north was taken by the British, the southwest by the French, the south by the Americans, and the east by the Russians. The victorious allies agree quickly on the most important question. Germany alone was at fault for this misery, and the one who is guilty shall pay. The Allies thus, feigning innocence, wash their hands of all blame, and as there is no one to hold them to account, the sticky blood on their hands is quickly and silently washed down the drain of history. Angela Merkel. If we think, in my country, to this day, about the fate of those Germans who lost their homes as a result of the war, then we must do so in full cognizance of our own responsibility, for it was Germany that was to blame from the beginning. And we do this without having to rewrite anything regarding this perpetual history of German responsibility. Such will never happen. Adolf Hitler, my intention was never to wage war, but to build a new social state at the highest level of culture.